The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Welcome to Garden Connections. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. We're here in the laboratory at Shady Oaks Nursery in Waseca, Minnesota, and we're going to learn more about what's growing in these little test tubes. It's one of the most popular garden plants around. You might be surprised. We'll also be visiting with Herbal Turtle Farms in Winona, Minnesota, and they're going to teach us how to grow mushrooms. I hope you'll stay with us on Garden Connections. We're here at Shady Oaks Nursery and Gordy Oslin has invited us to come and learn more about hostas. Thanks for letting us be here. Thanks for coming. So tell us about the nursery business. Have you always been involved in this? I've been involved for about 20 years. Uh, my father started the business 30 years ago. He was a plant biology professor and we just okay. Love plants. Love plants. Great. Right. Tell us a little bit about the hosta plant, and it is so popular. It Why is. is that? It's really the number one perennial plant in America, just because it's so versatile as far as colors, textures, um, variegation patterns. It is a broad leaf. It's very easy to maintain. It's just a great, great garden plant that grows so well. It grows so well, and in shade, a lot of places where gardeners are looking to fill space. Right, right. Not everything will grow in the shade, and hostas grow best in like a dappled shade mm -hmm. to a medium shade. Okay. So if you've got trees in your yard, that's an ideal place to put a hosta. Exactly. Or several. Several, yeah. Put drifts of them. <laughs> drifts of them. Well, tell us about some design elements that people can use hostas for, because as you mentioned, there are how many varieties? There's tons of them. There's over 5,000 varieties of 5, hostas. 5,000. Right. That's a lot. That's a lot. But we commercially, we grow about 200 varieties, because they start to look alike for people. Sure. There's subtle differences. Mm -hmm. uh, for design, we use a lot of miniatures. Uh, that's nice for along a border or in a little rock garden or even in a trough or a container. Do all hostas flower? You know, you see yes. those beautiful purple spikes that come out of a yes. lot of them. Yes, and at different times of the season. Some are blossoming now, others won't be until August. So you can pattern those in your garden so that you have something blooming all right. summer long. Right. Here at your nursery, you do a number of things, but I really want to talk about how you get hostas started because you have an, a fascinating process. Tell us a little bit about kind of the propagation of this tissue culture. What, what is that? What this is, is actually growing the plants in test tubes. Hostas divide normally. They don't generally come true from a seed or a cutting. Okay. So in a garden setting, you can divide your hostas in the spring and summer, even in the fall. Oh, really? Right. Any time of year, practically? Any time of year. But then you only get two or three plants maybe out of each time you divide right. it. So it, over a process of time, it takes a long time to get thousands of them. Right. With, so if you want it to happen a little bit faster, right. what With can tissue you do? culture, we, from one plant, we'll get about 700 in a year. Mm -hmm. So it really speeds up the process. Uh, we do it mainly to get new varieties out that are improved. Maybe they have better texture in their leaves, a thicker leaf, so they're more slug resistant. Oh uh, yes, that yes. is a problem with hostas, right. isn't it? Right. And so what part of the plant do you take to start this tissue culture? Describe that process for us. We take the growing point, it's called a meristem. We take that and divide that off the plant. You'll When the plant comes up in the spring, you'll see the little uh, shoot coming. We take mm -hmm. that shoot, we peel off the outer edges and clean it up with a bleach solution. Okay. Uh, tissue culture is a sterile process. Uh, we're growing it in a media that has nutrients, but it has all the nutrients and things that a plant would need. But that's it and but nothing more. it's also more. what the mold and bacteria like. Ah. So it's like growing an auger dish in your biology class <laughs> okay. of what, what you're trying to do. So we try to keep the mold bacteria out and right. out of that plant. Out of that. And is that, you place them in these little test tubes? Is this yes. what they look like? That's or what, what stage like. of development is this one? This is what's called stage two. And this is the dividing phase. And we actually put the dividing hormone into this. And 
every six to eight weeks, we can take that plant and divide out. This one will probably get two or three plants out of it. And is this, this darker part, is that what's considered what would root then? That is really a callus. It's okay. kind of the, the growing point of the hosta. It is, okay. So we don't really look for roots at this stage. We try to, it just takes more energy. So we're just nice. looking for divisions at this stage. And you said you can get two or three out of, out of something right. like this? Right, right. And then you re, I don't want to say plant them, but you put them in another little test tube like yes. this? Yes, yeah. And we sterilize all these test tubes before there's plants in them mm -hmm. and the media that's in them so that it's uh, not um, mold and bacteria free, actually. Right, right. And then they come out into this room and right. they go under lights. Right. How long does that process take? Uh, they're under these lights for six to eight weeks. And then you divide again? Or divide how again. many times are you splitting these little test tubes? As many no. times as you need? As or? many times as we need. They and might go 40, 50 times. Well, really? Split them. But we'll have to restart them. They do get tired over time. So we do have a process where we restart the plants and get a fresh culture. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So when they're ready, because you sell these plants then to other nurseries or kind of in a wholesale situation, right. you aren't sending them little test tubes. I've never no. seen a little test tube in no. my garden center. No. No. <laughs> what, what do you do with them before they go out? Before they go out, we put them into this rooting tub. And in that is the hormones to tell the plant to root and they'll sit in this for about six weeks. This dark stuff, what, what, it, what is this? That's charcoal, just to release any impurities in the, in the media and that the plant might react to. And so is this a root coming through there? Uh, that's Not just the quite. base of the plant. These just aren't the rooted yet. Okay, so these have just the been put in. Right. Okay. About how long does it take for them to start putting out roots once they've been put in this media? They'll start roots probably in three to four weeks, but we'll wait for them to establish really enough get to right. some good ones going. This is a pretty one. It's got a little striped yeah. striped leaf. Yeah. I don't know. This one is actually a yucca. Uh, oh, is that right? Yeah. I'll be We're darned. Doing yucca this week. So what other plants do you grow here besides hostas? We grow agaves, which are, you know, a desert plant. They're mm -hmm. great for, you know, just containers on your patio, right. that sort of thing. Yeah, we've just been talking about succulents and cactus right. recently, so right. that's a, a type. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So then we do heucras, coral bells is the common name. Mm -hmm. We do about a dozen different uh, heucras. Varieties of those as well. So you get them to put out some roots. Yeah. And Plants? Then we plant in the greenhouse, and that process can take 10 to 12 weeks. Oh my goodness, you have and a lot of time invested. It's a lot of time in invested, is so right. So 10 to 12 weeks, and then they're in more of a regular potting mix. Right, right. And then you ship them out. I understand you ship all over the world. Yeah, some. That's great. Quite a bit to Canada, some to Europe. And to Europe as well. For the home gardener, they're, they're not going to go to this. This is quite an extensive process. But you mentioned dividing, and that's probably a home gardener's method for getting more plants, though not a very fast one, as you've right. mentioned. Right. How big should a hosta plant be before a home gardener tackles a division? Uh, it should be maybe a couple years old first, just to get it nicely established, mm -hmm. and then they could start dividing it. Mm -hmm. And you talked about waves or drifts of hostas. What other design suggestions would you have for home gardeners to use? I like use? a mix of hosta as far as colors, blues and golds. You can do variegateds with other solid colors. Uh, the other thing is to use finer textured plants with them, oh, like okay. ferns. Mm -hmm. uh, still bees are a great shade plant also. They mix well with hostas. Uh, ligularias are nice. Uh, they get a little bigger, they get a yellow flower. Okay. Um, uh, Carex is a great shade grass-like plant, Hacnacloa. It's also it. nice. Very nice. Yeah. Are there any hostas that are especially good for colder climates like southern Minnesota and northern Iowa? You ship all over the world, but, but what kind of Virtually varieties? they're all great right here. Hostas are hardy as a zone three. Oh, they're really um, tough then? They're really tough, yeah. They so, grow great in Minnesota. It's probably one of the better places to grow from choices. upper Midwest is prime. So we put these hostas outside most of the time, although they can be containerized. So we're at the, the whims of, of Mother Nature, but in general, what is the care required for a hosta in terms of how much water? If it doesn't rain for a while, do you need to go out and, and water them? Should you mulch around them? Give us some if helpful they're tips. they're new, newly planted, yes, I would keep them watered well. Hostas like more water than people generally think. 
Oh. Um, they will tolerate a lot of water. They're also fairly drought resistant, but I wouldn't go there when they're first newly planted. Okay, so they you like, could put them in a rain garden or in a low spot in your yard? Sure, sure. They like just a general purpose fertilizer that lasts three, four months. I would do that in the spring, mm -hmm. so the fertilizer dissipates by fall. Okay. Uh, if you fertilize them in the fall, they may not go dormant as readily. Ah, oh, okay. So that's important. And in the fall, do you trim the foliage or do you just let it die back on its own and I leave it, it alone? I let it die back myself. It's okay. personal preference. Okay. It provides a little more cover for it if it doesn't snow right away and gets too cold. And otherwise, does it need any special covering? Do you want to pile up leaves around your hostas? You can, certainly the first year. Or we mulch with the bark mulch, too. That helps okay. mm -hmm. uh, and also looks nice year-round. So you're more interested in protecting the root than you are necessarily right. Right. covering it completely. Right. Yep. So. It moderates the temperature of those roots so they don't freeze and thaw right. so much. Right. right. Okay. What's your favorite thing about hostas? Favorite thing is just the beauty of them. They're just, um, they last a long time. They always look nice, so. I'd With over 200 varieties, do you have a favorite single variety? Uh, hosta Touch of Class, probably. Ah. It's a real thick-leaved hosta, mm -hmm. so blue and a gold. It's a variegated hosta, mm -hmm. slug-resistant, and it looks nice all season. Gordy, you are a wealth of information about oh. hostas. Thank you so much for having You're us welcome. here. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us. Great. Stay tuned for more Garden Connections. We're here in Winona, Minnesota, and we're at Herbal Turtle Farm, where we're going to learn all about growing mushrooms. And the gurus of mushroom growing are Brian Krigler and Caitlin Forrester. Thanks so much for inviting us out to your farm. Thank you for coming. So why mushrooms? Why did you choose that as, a, as the plant to grow? Well, uh, it's kind of a long, complicated story, um, but we've always been fascinated by you know, the fungal world. And my dad got into growing mushrooms as a hobby probably about 15 years ago. Um, so I've been helping them out doing that, and it was kind of a neat thing for us to do together. Now, I said plant, but mushrooms really aren't plants, right? What, what is a mushroom? Yeah. It's actually a fungus, and it's the fruiting body of a fungus. So um, just like a tree has an apple, a fungus has a mushroom. Okay. And how many different varieties do you guys grow here? Uh, right now we're growing three, but we're hoping to expand to six this year, I think. And are there some that are more popular for cooks, or how do you know which ones will fit in the marketplace? Well, cooks really like the ones that we can't grow. Oh. So that's, okay. <laughs> you know, they love uh, morale, they love chanterelle, they mm. love truffles. Okay. All of those mushrooms have mycorrhizal relationships, with, meaning they have a living relationship with the tree. With the tree. It's okay. very difficult for us to mimic that. Mm -hmm. um, but we can mimic uh, saprophytic relationships, which are decomposers, right? Okay. So the shiitake are decomposers, the oyster okay. mushrooms are decomposers, the wine caps are decomposers. And they still taste good. And I can create that <laughs> atmosphere. And so um, those are the three that we're primarily dealing with now. They're great culinary mushrooms, and shiitake, of course, have a lot of medicinal benefits to them as well. So. Great. Now, that is not all that you do on the farm. You may be gurus of mushrooms, but you guys have other things as well. What else do you have here on your farm? We also do a full vegetable CSA. So we have 40 families that we support. Um, people sign up at the beginning of the year, and they basically get a share in our farm. And every week for 20 weeks, they get a box of vegetables, whatever we have that week. And so CSA is Community Supported Agriculture. Yep. And, and so they kind of pitch in in the beginning and then they get the bounty throughout the season. Mm -hmm. And then we also do fresh herbs for different co-ops and restaurants. Okay, so mushrooms are the specialty and you're gonna show us how to do it. Absolutely. Right. All right, so Brian, we're gonna drill a few holes, right? right? Yep, and you know, safety first safety on the first. farm, okay. so. Sounds good. You know. And so what kind of log is this? This is a, uh, this is an ironwood log. We, we do primarily hardwoods. Uh, and the reason being is a, a softer wood is going to decompose quicker. Okay. It's kind of a labor-intensive process to get this done, okay. and so um, we want it to stick around for a couple years. Our average log will last four to six years. Okay. Um, and so we use a lot of ironwood because we have access to it, and we use a lot of oak because it, we have access to the tops. 
And when you say you want it to last that long, do you re-inoculate it? Because that's the process you're going to show us, right? Correct. Is inoculating. Are, yeah. are you going to re-inoculate it? Or that's how long you can expect a log to fruit right. while you have it. So basically the inoculation process is introducing the fungus to the substrate, to this log here. Okay. Once we do that, the fungus is living in the log and it's feeding off the log. And so as long as there's nutrients in that log, we're going to get mushrooms out of it. Great. All right. So first thing, drilling some holes. Right. How big? How many? Well. We usually do 40 to 50 logs, uh, holes per log. Um, you know, I've got a specialized 12 millimeter bit here. It's about an inch deep. Uh, and I've put it on an angle grinder uh, adapter mm -hmm. because we do such a huge amount of logs that um, it makes it really quick. We started out with just a drill when we first started mm -hmm. and it cut our production time in, I don't know, a fifth or so. So okay. um, this quicker. makes it much quicker and, and uh, you know, let me show you how we do it. Yes, all right, you go for it. <laughs> That, that is quick. So that would have taken an me. Inch deep. Yeah, that would have taken me a lot longer before. Oh, absolutely. Um, but we do kind of a diamond-shaped pattern here. Mm -hmm. Is there um, a special reason for that? There's a reason for that because the fungus will move quicker with the grain than it will against the grain. Uh -huh. So we do about two inches wide and then um, six to eight inches long. Long. Okay. Yeah. So we've built this custom table here, and once we get these holes drilled, then we kind of. Um, we'll take it and we'll roll it down the table so we don't have to lift logs and we'll roll oh, down sure, to the time. next section on the table All right. where we'll actually fill up these holes with a sawdust spawn that contains the shiitake. Got it. And Caitlin, that's what you're going to show us next. Mm -hmm. All right, step one. And now we're on to step two. Caitlin, what are you doing here? I'm inoculating the logs with a sawdust spawn. Okay, and so this is it, right? Yep. The spawn is just living inside of this kind of sawdust cool. right now. Yeah. And do you keep actually, it in the fridge then? We do, yep. Um, there's actually little mushrooms that are already fruiting in here, and the white is just all of the mycelium living in the spawn. Look at that. In the sawdust. And so you've got a special tool here. You've got all these holes that Brian drilled, and you have a little special tool that plugs up. Let me see. Let's yep. show folks. So it's just open on that end. Mm -hmm. And you just jam it in the sawdust spawn, and it just creates a little when you push it up. Oh, plug it's just that plug. fills the hole and you want to get it as tight as possible because you don't want any air in there to dry out the spawn and kill it. So it needs to stay moist. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we'll show us a couple of those. Let's Oops, I'll get out of your way. Just jam it in there. Pop it once on the end and check it with your finger to make sure that the hole is tight. Oh, I see. Yep. So that is pretty firm. Can I try one? Yep. All right. And So it doesn't fit in there exactly. Nope, just goes right over the top. Whoa. How's that? I do all right? Yep. Okay, <laughs> great. So you put these in, fill them up, and then what are you gonna do after that? Then we cover it with the wax and that keeps the moisture in and that also keeps other fungus out so that oh, it can so. take over the log. Okay, so step one, step two, and on to three with the wax. All right, let's check that out. Okay, so we plugged a few of these holes. Did we do a good job? Uh, well, so part of the wax person's job is to check. And if there's any holes left open, we scream obnoxiously at the people that are plugging logs. And I see a lot of empty a holes here. A lot of here. empty holes, okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. All right, we'll, we'll demonstrate I'm... on the ones we did. <laughs> so um, what we're gonna do now, and I think Caitlin mentioned it, is that we're gonna cover these holes with a wax. And this is just a paraffin wax. Some people use bees wax. Oh, okay. um, that's way too expensive for us to, oh, really? you know, okay. to put on uh, on the logs. We'll know. make candles out of How it. How hot is it? Is it this is fairly cool. cool. Um, normally we'll, we'll have it pretty hot. It's it's had some time to cool off. Uh -huh. but, uh, okay. And you just kind of paint it right over there. Can I do yeah, one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Just a little dab or a lot. A little generous. Dab, as long as it's all covered up. It's okay. And redip every time, I suppose. Yeah. Not necessarily. Depends on how much wax you got. But. Okay. That looks good. Mm -hmm. All right. So these get all covered up. Then what? Well, we'll, never, we'll hammer, you can see all these labels behind you here. Normally we'll, we'll hammer a label on. Yeah, let's grab one. And uh, if you look at that label there. Um, Is it upside down? Yeah, so this one says N Velvet 512. Okay, so the strain name, which is Night Velvet, and the date that we inoculated. So this was oh. May 2012. Okay, the so reason that was just this spring, and they're here in this big pile. They are, yes, and these are all gonna get moved up into the woods. Um, right now, the, the 
spawn is running through these logs. So we're just, we got them out of the way, you know. Um, but we label them that way because we have different strains. We have wide range strains, which fruit pretty much our whole season, April through October. Okay. We have cold weather strains, which we don't force fruit, which we'll show you in a little bit about that mm -hmm. process. We use larger diameter logs on those because you don't have to lift them up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and they'll come early and late. They like the colder weather. That's oh. the name cold weather right. Yep. right and then we have warm weather strains which thrive in the very heat of the summertime okay. so oh, by uh, yeah so by mixing it all up it kind of ensures that we have, have crop something. throughout yeah so when they go into a wood pile like this how long are they going to sit here we'll put these out either this fall or next spring probably this fall because sometimes if we let them sit too long the mycelium will actually fuse the logs together oh, and the, can't get the bark apart. will come off when we pull them apart. We learn the hard way. On and that. sometimes if we put them out too soon, woodpeckers get to them and eat out all of the spot, oh, the spawn. Okay. So right. that's it's the weirdest for you thing. Waking, waiting for that to spread throughout that log just the right time. And then you can put them out on the hill. In our laying yard. Yeah? In your laying yard. All right, let's go check that out. Let's check it out. All right. All right, so we have drill holes, we've filled those holes, and we've sealed those holes, and now we're in the woods. <laughs> what, do, what do we do next? So now, basically, um, you saw that big dead stack that we had yes. um, of finished logs. We move those up to the woods, and we let them, the fungus do its thing, and basically it's gonna run through the log, and I've got one here. You can see the ends of this log is white, Wait, see those yeah. little white spots, mm -hmm. and it's closest to where we drilled that hole. Sure. Um, so if I were to cut off the end of this log, we would see white all throughout. That's the fungus. That's a good sign. We like to you see that. Okay. Yeah, that means that it's run completely through this log. Um, and once that happens, we know that it's probably time to soup, force fruit these logs. And we do that by soaking them, soaking them. in tanks of water. Right. So. And here they are. You just dunk the whole thing and you've got some cement blocks to hold it down. Mm -hmm. And basically two things are happening here. Um, the sudden increase in moisture and the temperature variance, this cold yeah, water, cold water yeah. is shocking this log. Um, you know, in ancient, um, you know, ancient Japan, where this all sort of originated, they used to actually drum on the logs. Oh, is that right? Uh huh. And it would f it would shock them into doing it. We don't drum here, although right. maybe we, we could get into that. I don't know. But <laughs> Another show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you guys choose the cold water method and you soak them. How long do they stay in the cold water tank? Overnight. Oh, yeah. so fairly short. Yeah. Okay. And from here, then you stand them up. Is that right? Right. Yep. Yeah. So we've got lines throughout the laying yard that we put up and we just form kind of a tripod. Mm -hmm. And it's easier for us to harvest the mushrooms that way. Plus they grow a little more uniformly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how long does it take once you've soaked them and you've got them standing up? How long before you see the first fruits? Um, fairly quickly, it depends on how, um, how primed the logs are and how old the logs are. Mm -hmm. With these ones that we've got in there now, since they're very new, mm -hmm. uh, these are last season's logs, probably within the next day or two we'll start seeing pin development. Okay, and a pin is just the very beginning, very kind of like the big, sprout yeah, of the mushroom. Mm -hmm. And it also it. depends on the weather. If it's really hot and humid, they'll be ready to go and like four days from start to finish. Right. Okay. And do you soak them more than once? Or really yeah. once is all it takes and then they're good to go for the duration of the log? No. Mm -mm. no. So we, we've got a very strict schedule actually. Okay. Because once we force fruit a log, we let it rest um, for about two months. So this batch of logs will produce mushrooms for us and then it gets a two month vacation. Okay. And then it has to go back to work in two months. So. Got it. All right. Well, let's go take a look at some of them that are fruiting now. Yeah. Great. Back down the hill. So this is a section where you've got actively fruiting logs in here. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, these look great. So these were logs that we had pulled out of the tank and then set up on these lines. Um, and after a couple of days, you'll see that uh, this is what we call a pinning mushroom. So it's a baby shiitake. Just little baby Aww. ones. Oh, yeah, isn't that cute? Uh, and, you know, and ideally this log gets covered with these little pins. Mm -hmm. uh, and they and don't come out where the, where the spore was drilled in necessarily. They kind of pop out all over. Wherever they want, wherever yeah. They want. Uh, initially, when we first do a log its first year, they'll, they'll come out 
where we drilled the hole because that's where it's most concentrated. Okay. After that, the fungus lives throughout the log. They'll just pop out where they want. Wherever to. they want. Yeah. Okay. And then they get big, and they look like these. Those look fantastic. Thank you. And so that is another three, four days? Yeah, the, the whole process, of course, depending on weather, right. um, takes five to seven days. Five to seven days. Mm -hmm. Great. And so what do you guys do with these? How, how do you prepare them in the kitchen? Our favorite way is just to saute them with butter and garlic. Uh, we also really like to make a little thing called shiitake. Shiitake. What's that? It's shiitake that tastes like bacon. You just oh. roast it in the oven for an hour. Yeah. Stir it every 10 minutes. At 350, baste it with a little oil until it looks like it's crispy and burnt and it tastes exactly like bacon it's because so it's got a very strong umami flavor, shiitake, and everything cooks out of it except for that. Well, we have learned so much about mushrooms. These look fantastic. And so you'd harvest them at about this size or do you take these as well? Well, you know, we like to have, you know, a mixed, a mixed bag of mushrooms and so, um, We'll do larger ones, smaller ones, and so we get a nice mix. Oh, those look great. Look at that beautiful brown color. You can keep that one. All right, awesome. I'm taking this home. <laughs> oh, and it smells so good. Brian, Caitlin, thank you so much for explaining this whole thing to us. Now we know more about how these wonderful mushrooms grow. Really Thanks. appreciate it. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. All right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Garden Connections, and I hope you'll join us again next week. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. On Garden Connections, we'd love to see photos of your garden. Or if you have questions for our garden experts, contact us by emailing garden at ksmq.org or like us on Facebook.